Good evening. I'm Stephen Barkus, the curator of the Gun Historical Museum in Washington, Connecticut. Thank you for joining us for How Baseball Happened, Outrageous Lies, The True Story Revealed. Washington, Connecticut is a baseball town, and this evening, Thomas Gilbert, our distinguished guest, will share the real story about the origins of America's favorite pastime. Included will be a mention of Washington, Connecticut's own remarkable place in baseball history with one of the earliest photographs of a baseball game in action, the Gunnery Reunion game, which was played on the Washington Green in 1869. This rare photograph is preserved in the collection of the Gun Museum. Gene Solomon, a trustee of the Gun Memorial Library and Museum will be introducing Tom. During this lecture, we ask that you please mute both your audio and video settings. If you have questions, you may submit them throughout the lecture in the chat box, and Tom will answer some of them at the end. Please note that our next guest lecturer is historian and author Judith Tankard, who will present Ellen Shipman and the American Garden on Monday, May 17th at 6.30. Please mark your calendars and register for this presentation on the Gun Museum's website. We'd also like to remind you that the Gun Museum is participating in the annual two-day Give Local fundraiser starting tomorrow, Tuesday, April 20th. This is our only fundraiser of the year and we have a goal to raise $15,000 for the museum. Every donation we receive during Give Local is increased with bonus funds from the Connecticut Community Foundation. So this is the best time of the year to show your support. Go to the museum's website, gunmuseum.org, and click on the Give Local icon. We greatly appreciate your continuing interest in the Gun Museum and support of our work to preserve and share the history of Washington, Connecticut. Now I'd like to hand it over to Jean. Hello and good evening. My name is Jean Solomon. It is my great pleasure to welcome our guest lecturer, Thomas Gilbert. Thomas is an expert baseball historian and prolific author who has written numerous books on baseball, including Baseball and the Color Line, Playing First, Roberto Clemente, and How Baseball Happened, Outrageous Lies Exposed, The True Story Revealed. Tom John Thorne, Major League Baseball's official historian writes, How Baseball Happened, is a brilliant new approach to our game and calls it the next great book of baseball history. How Baseball Happened won the 2020 Casey Award, one of the two major national prizes for the best baseball book of the year and was runner up for the Seymour Medal. Casey Award judge Laureen Parks called it by far the best, brilliant, stimulating, funny, it places baseball firmly in the mainstream of American culture. Gilbert obtained his bachelor's degree in classics and classical languages, literature and linguistics at Yale University. He lives with his wife in Greenpoint in Brooklyn, the former home of the Eckford Club, baseball's 1862 and 1863 world champions. Like baseball's amateur 19th century forefathers, Thomas plays ball on the weekend, socializes with firefighters, and is active in local politics. Thank you, Thomas, for your participation here this evening. And now I'll hand this over to you. Well, thank you, Jean, and thank you, Steve. Um, and thanks to the Gun Historical Museum for inviting me uh, tonight to talk about my favorite subject. Um, I, at this point, I spent most of my life writing about early baseball. Um, let's start with uh, the book and the title of my new book, uh, the somewhat intentionally provocative title. Um, this book was a project that took me on a fascinating journey into 19th century America, which was a very, very different country from the one we live in today. I encountered quite a few surprises along the way. One was that baseball had no single inventor, but it did in a sense happen in a particular time and place and for particular reasons. It's hard to believe, but there was a time when we Americans didn't have baseball or any national team sports. 
Sports take up a huge amount of cultural and economic space in our country today. In 2019, we spent $73.5 billion on sports as entertainment and $50 billion on sports that we play. And that's more than our total annual expenditures on the space program, the National Institutes of Health and Mexican food combined. The rest of the world looks at us and sees a sports obsessed country where the four seasons of the year are baseball, football, basketball, and ice hockey, where ordinary people run and work out into late middle age, where old age and golf are inseparable, and where someone who I'd like to have a talk with sometime coined the word athleisure. Until shortly before the Civil War, however, we were known for the exact opposite. <clears throat> we were a country with no sports leagues, no ballparks, no stadiums. Nobody followed or rooted for their hometown teams because there weren't any. Mainstream newspapers didn't cover sports because almost no American adults were interested in playing them or watching them. There was one widely played team sport, cricket, which was surprising, unsurprisingly dominated by immigrants from Great Britain who were then about 6% of the United States population. In the 19th century, a steady stream of celebrity tourists came from the UK to the US and they wrote books about us. And these books often sold well. The United States and Great Britain were not always on good terms in the 19th century, that's putting it mildly. But for all their feelings of superiority, the English were always curious about what their dynamic former colony was up to. And no matter how much we feared, resented, or even hated the English, we never got tired of hearing what they thought of us. And Great Britain, of course, is the sporting motherland, the nation that gave the world cricket, soccer, rugby, hockey, modern boxing, and golf. Uh, if you've all muted yourself, I can't hear you, but I'm gonna ask you anyway, setting aside American sports for one moment, see if you can name an important world sport that did not originate in the British Isles. Um, anyone come up with tennis? That's pretty much the answer. Uh, after that, the list starts to thin out with polo and lacrosse, and I'm not sure what's in fourth place. A common theme for visiting 19th century American travel writers, people like Charles Dickens and Francis Trollope, Anthony Trollope's mother, was to lament their American cousin's dreary devotion to business, what Washington Irving called the almighty dollar, and our shocking indifference to physical fitness and sports. To the English, we were a nation of soft, squinting, dyspeptic office creatures chained all day to our desk, thinking of nothing but making money. There were exceptions. Boxing and horse racing were popular in early America, but they were about money too. We participated in the nose by betting on them. And then baseball happened, seemingly out of nowhere. My book is about how and why. One of the most surprising parts of the story to me was that the answers had so little to do with baseball and sports themselves. Born in New York City as a folk or children's game, and it was actually once called the New York game, baseball as a sport began to spread outside of the city in the late 1850s, first as recreation and second as entertainment. Baseball, the sport, was completely and gloriously new. It was American made. It was not primarily an occasion for betting and it blazed the path that all other American sports have followed. Now, even though they're sometimes used interchangeably, there are important differences between a game and a sport, which I wanna talk about for a second. The two are often confused even by historians. A game is just that, a casual informal folk pastime. A sport on the other hand is a game that is taken seriously by adults and therefore more organized than a mere game Sports have clubs, statistics, rules, referees, press coverage, championships, and not all games become sports. One more thing, a fully formed sport can be amateur. Baseball, for example, traveled the entire evolutionary path from game to sport before any of its players were paid. Baseball has a long, possibly even ancient history as a game. Before it emerged as a sport, the game we call baseball, was one of many local bat and ball games that were played in different parts of early 19th century America, mostly for fun and mostly by children. There were a few isolated islands of adult play. For instance, uh, if you are interested in sports history, you might've run across something called the Massachusetts game that was a bat and ball game played in Boston, and the suburbs. There was a game centered in Philadelphia called town ball. Connecticut played a game called wicket. 
um, and there were other gangs. Um, these were isolated islands. There were isolated islands of adults playing these games in very small numbers. But before the late 1850s, when the earliest baseball clubs that we know much about show up on the historical radar, the vast majority of American adults had never played baseball or heard of baseball. So let's get back to the why and how. Baseball has origin myths. And it's a funny choice of word, myth. Um, I came to the conclusion after researching them that the word itself is part of the lie. And it's in a way an outrageous use of the word myth because baseball's origin stories aren't myths. Um, the choice of vocabulary in a way is asking us to give them a pass for saying something that isn't true. You've probably heard one or maybe two of them and you may know that they're not 100% accurate. You may not know how untrue they are and why they were made up. Well, I'm gonna quote my own book. This is how the book begins. There's more than one way to get history wrong. Sometimes the truth is forgotten. Sometimes it is misunderstood. Sometimes it is erased and replaced with lies. When it comes to telling the story of where it came from, baseball has accomplished all three. And this is where the outrageous lies of my subtitle come in. Why outrageous? Not just that they aren't true, but they're intentionally untrue. Um, I did learn something from my many years of doing genealogical research, um, personally and professionally. And what it taught me was that there's a kind of randomness to facts. Facts are just facts. Um, the lies that people tell about their own family history are fascinating, and they tell you a lot about who they are, their values, their identity, their aspirations. So what about baseball's origin stories? Baseball's told two main stories. So we'll call the first one outrageous lie number one. And it centers on this man. That's Abner Doubleday. Um, the story of the Doubleday story begins well into the professional era in the early 1900s, when major league club owner and sporting goods magnate Albert Spaulding, who published Spaulding's official baseball guide, the official annual of professional baseball, found himself in a public debate over baseball's origins with one of his own employees, the guide's 80-year-old and increasingly crotchety editor, Henry Chadwick. Now, Spaulding is a fascinating character. He was born and raised in Rockford, Illinois, when that was more or less the Western frontier. He emerged as a star pitcher as a teenager in 1867, uh, later became, went professional. And uh, if you have any appreciation for baseball stats, you might want to be sitting for this. His career uh, record in professional baseball is 252 wins, 65 losses, 2.13 ERA. Uh, that's what his record was when he retired in 1878 at age 27. Uh, from an arm, arm injury? No, he retired because he was making so much money with his sporting goods company, which of course is still with us, uh, that he didn't have time to play baseball. Um, Spalding also wrote the first full baseball history, co-founded the National League. And in the 1900s, he's the most important uh, owner in baseball and the de facto chief executive of MLB. What about Chadwick? Henry Chadwick was the most important early baseball writer, but he was more than that. He was early baseball's chief promoter. He acted as a one-man marketing and publicity department for baseball in the 1850s and 60s. He was one of the earliest and most influential New Yorkers to grasp the importance of selling sports to an emerging new class of prosperous urbanites that some historians call the emerging urban bourgeoisie and I shorten it to EUB in my book. Um, who were these people? They're prosperous, they're upperly mobile, they're reform-minded, they live in the city. They're the people who had the money, the leisure, and the inclination to play sports. This class, and they look very familiar to us, they're the ancestor of our modern middle class. Um, they also had social influence, which men like Chadwick hoped that they would lend to this young game of baseball. The 19th century American EUV was moralistic, overwhelmingly Protestant. And this explains a lot. It explains why Chadwick campaigned long and hard to keep baseball amateur, because amateurism facilitated social and racial exclusion, and exclusion meant respectability. 
He also tried to keep the sport as far as possible away from gambling, which was a deal breaker for the EUV. Chadwick wrote the first baseball uh, rules uh, instructional book. He served on baseball's rules committee. He guided the development of the sport, invented most of the basis, basic statistics that we still use today, along with the scoring system and the box score. He's not a household name today, but he was when he died in 1908. If you're ever in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, make a point of visiting his grave, which has clay base paths, marble bases, bronze baseball equipment, and uh, his grave monument states in stone, father of baseball. In the early 1900s, Chadwick, who'd come to Brooklyn from England as a boy, came up with a theory that baseball had grown out of an English children's game called rounders. These were fighting words at a time when the United States was emerging from Great Britain's shadow as a world power, not to mention that baseball had always made a point of marketing itself as purely American. So Spalding responds by creating the infamous Mills Commission, which in 1908 concluded that Abner Doubleday had invented baseball in 1839 in Cooperstown, New York. Who is Abner Doubleday? A career military man, a Civil War hero, a prolific memoirist, which is an important detail because we know a lot about him. And one of the things we know is how uninterested he really was in baseball, possibly less than any American of his time. He had two very trivial, tangible connections to the game. In the 1870s, he once ordered some baseball equipment for his men to use while he was in West Texas fighting the Comanche Indians. And his great nephew bought part of the Mets in 1980. To give you an idea of how false the euphemistically named Doubleday myth really is, in 1893, the great man died and was given a grand funeral in New York City. He was eulogized by his good friend, A.G. Mills, who didn't mention, nor did anyone else, that Doubleday had invented baseball or had any interest in baseball at all. That's the same Mills who chaired the commission that 15 years later declared that Doubleday had invented our national pastime. The worst part of the Doubleday myth is not that it was just wrong, but that it was intended to block serious inquiry into where baseball actually came from, and for a while it succeeded. In living memory, to publicly dissent from this myth was to displease the professional baseball establishment, something sports writers who want a career tend not to do, or even worse, to appear unpatriotic. What about the second story? The Doubleday story, this man. This is Alexander Joy Cartwright Jr. Uh, if you have read any about, any about baseball history, you've probably seen his name, and that's his Hall of Fame plaque. The Doubleday story replaced an earlier baseball origin story that actually goes back to the mid 1850s. The story that a club called the Knickerbockers, one of whose members was a banker named Alexander Cartwright, was the first baseball club. If you Google the origins of baseball today, this is what you'll probably get. A story that goes something like this. In 1845, a group of amateur athletes from New York City formed the first baseball club, published the first rules. In many versions of the story, Cartwright is the driving force behind both of these. Among other innovations, the club outlaw was the first to outlaw the practice of soaking, which is throwing the ball at the runner in order to put them out. Uh, this was an important step in baseball's evolution from a children's pastime because adults preferred a game from which they didn't have to limp home. Running out of playing space in New York City, the Knickerbockers wandered in the wilderness until in 1845, they found a home in the Elysian Fields in Hoboken, New Jersey, 15 minutes by ferry from Barclay Street in Lower Manhattan. The Knickerbockers were influential gentlemen who popularized the game, up sprang other clubs, the Eagles, the Gothams, the Empires, they were followed by more imitators in Brooklyn, New Jersey, and the New York metropolitan area. These first players were dilettantes who put more effort into post-game banquets than into vulgar pursuits like recruiting, training, or trying to win. The Knickerbockers ruled over baseball until, to their dismay, the game spread downward to the unwashed working classes. As it spread outward to Boston, Philadelphia, and the rest of the country, the Knickerbockers lost control of the sport they had made, opening a Pandora's box of professionalism, gambling, and corruption. Well, two parts of this story are true. Almost all of the Knickerbockers were white American-born Protestants, and the Barclay Street Ferry did get you to Hoboken in 15 minutes. The Knickerbocker rules, in fact, contain nothing new. They describe how the New York version of the version of baseball had been played for some time, quite likely 
by all different kinds of people. The rules were not the first written rules, just the oldest ones that we have survived. The Knickerbockers were merchants, professionals, and businessmen of some means, but they were not gentlemen in the mid 19th century sense, i.e. living on inherited wealth. They were influential, but their goal wasn't to make the game more popular. If anything, it was the opposite. According to one of their founders, William Wheaton, who moved to California in the gold rush and was uh, out of the baseball loop after that, he said in an interview that he and his friends founded the club in order not to have to play with people they considered their social inferiors. One of their more prominent members, James White Davis, was instrumental in drawing baseball's first color line in 1867, explicitly keeping African-Americans out of organized baseball. So enforcing baseball's high social standards, not popularizing the game, was the fundamental reason for the Knickerbocker Baseball Club. Okay, in 1936, when the amateur era was very poorly remembered, the folks promoting the idea, idea of a National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown dusted off the Doubleday myth to justify locating it there because the future Civil War commander may have attended prep school in Cooperstown. This provoked a backlash from some historians who argued correctly that the game was actually far older than 1839 and from descendants uh, of Alexander Cartwright who felt that he deserved the lion's share of the credit usually given to the Knickerbockers as a group. So this explains there was a, a kind of ugly compromise. Cooperstown got the hall. Cartwright, who for all we know, wasn't a particularly good player, got a plaque in the same room as real athletes like Babe Ruth and Christy Matthewson. And if you visit the hall of fame today, you will see this plaque that I'm showing you. And it says that he was the father of modern baseball, set the base paths at 90 feet, established nine innings as a full game, organized the Nicaragua Baseball Club, carried the game to the Pacific Coast and Hawaii. We now know that he did not do any of these things. But you can't edit a bronze plaque, which I have always suspected is why they make them out of bronze. Okay, let's get to the point of these lies. What is the point? Well, they have a propaganda purpose to assert that baseball is native born and completely American. If it's invented by a particular American at a particular time and place, then it can't be English. I think that's about 90% of it. Another purpose that playing baseball is respectable and a proper use of an adult's time. Uh, something we no longer have to argue for, but newspapers in the 19th century are full of this particular argument. If men like the Knickerbockers are playing baseball, then it has nothing to do with gambling, drinking, violence, the evils that most respectable Protestant Americans associated with all male activities. Okay, time for the real story, which is somewhat more complex. Um, it's way too long for me to finish it in 35 minutes, but I'm gonna pick a few highlights to give you an idea of uh, what it's about. And there are surprises in this story too. Baseball as our first national sport happened with astonishing suddenness. Think about it. The story starts in lower Manhattan in the mid 1850s at which point baseball had been played by a handful of clubs for decades. But the baseball world was small and insignificant. How small was it? Well, in 1854, a man named William Hathaway Van Cott, who we're gonna to return to, uh, a judge in New York City, he wrote a letter. He was president of the Gotham Baseball Club. Uh, he wrote a letter to all the New York papers trying to promote and popularize the game. And he bragged that there were at least three established clubs and over 90 players. This is the state of baseball in 1854. <clears throat> 54, excuse me. Um, and this is an illustration of the game, uh, sort of fantasy illustration of a game in the Elysian Fields. And it looks a little bit like the gun photograph we're gonna talk about later, but you'll notice there's a lot of many things missing. Uh, there's almost nobody watching it. Um, there's a scorer's table, there's a few people watching, uh, probably a bookie or two, uh, friends of the players, um, the women in the background in the shelter, um, that's somewhat fantastical. Um, the journalists who were promoting baseball in the mid 19th century went out of their way to point out that women watched it. It was another argument for its respectability. I, I take it with a grain of salt. Um, okay. 1854, we have three clubs in Manhattan and they're claiming 90 or so members. 
what happened? What's baseball like 12 years later? And this is a picture of a game from 1866. And if you look at it, I want to point out a few things about it um, that are very significant. There's a fence around it because they're charging admission. Uh, there's a grandstand, which is actually full of women. There's a press box. Some of these people we're supposed to recognize and people like me do recognize them. Those are 19th century sports stars. These are members of the Brooklyn Atlantics. Look, we have a, oops, sorry. We have a raucous crowd here, including a pickpocket in the lower left-hand corner of being uh, semi-strangled by one of his victims. And there's people um, in the, right at the bottom of the picture, uh, these are uh, betting touts, they're taking bets. Um, so baseball in 1866 is a lot like baseball now. Um, and in 1866, as opposed to 1854, baseball is commonly played all over the United States. And it was called the national pastime. That was a cliche already in 1866. Um, all right. So uh, we're, in a, we're also four years from the founding of the first professional league, which was the National Association in 1871. Um, baseball goes from something that 90 people are doing in lower Manhattan to something everyone's doing all across the country in less than 15 years. And of course, don't forget that during that period, we took four or five out to fight the Civil War. So what drove this really rapid evolu evolution from a local game to a national sport? And <clears throat> what I discovered was that baseball was a kind of broad-based social movement. Uh, it was made up of a loose and somewhat varying coalition, uh, including people like physicians, educators, and reformers. Journalists eventually joined the cause once they gave up on cricket. Many members of the, these professions played baseball and belonged to the earliest known baseball clubs. And many became leaders of amateur baseball's national governing body. This movement had serious purposes. One was national unification, um, the lack of which in the minds of many was a major weakness of young America, which they saw as made up of distant, disjointed and independent states. It's no coincidence that many baseball players and advocates were also involved in building the new communications and transportation technologies that were knitting the country together and enabling Western expansion. Things like canals, steam power, railroads, mass market publishing, and the telegraph. Finally, there was public health reform. Positions are all over early baseball, especially the leadership of individual clubs and baseball's national association. A good example is Dr. Joseph B. Jones, president of the Brooklyn Excelsiors uh, in the late 1850s and the, into the 1860s. He built the Excelsiors, who were the first Brooklyn team, into the best team in baseball. And in 1860, he took them on the first baseball tours outside of the New York metropolitan area. Uh, he went up um, the Hudson, he took, went left, took a left at the Erie Canal, he went out to Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, uh, later in the year down to the Middle Atlantic, to Baltimore, Washington, and Philadelphia, and then eventually New England. Um, Doc Adams, who was a physician, was the most important Knickerbocker and longtime chair of baseball's rules committee. Among his uh, the other rules that we can attribute to him, not Alexander Cartwright, nine inning games. There was a national convention where they would every year vote on rules changes. And there was a bitter argument over whether baseball should have seven or nine inning games. Uh, and Doc Adams won the argument, which is why games last nine innings. Although uh, you've probably noticed that we're playing seven inning games and double headers right now. So in Major League Baseball, if anybody listening to me is in New Haven, you might want to go to Evergreen Cemetery just to make sure that Doc isn't spinning in his grave. Early and mid 19th century America, particularly its cities, had terrible problems with epidemic disease and poor sanitation. New York City had no sewers or reliable source of clean water till the middle of the century. Streets were open sewers and garbage dumps with wandering feral pigs being a feature of New York City streets. Medical authorities who didn't understand uh, bacteria or viruses blamed this for the repeated waves of deadly epidemic disease that struck New York and other cities of the 19th century. This is why New York City row houses were built with elevated first stories reached by stoops uh, because 
compacted garbage caused street levels to rise. Uh, public health reformers wanted to cure these problems by uh, improving public health systems, but they also thought it was equally important to promote individual physical fitness, that we needed fresh air, sunlight, and exercise to protect us against diseases like cholera and yellow fever. In the 1860s, a baseball man, banker, publisher, real estate developer, and early leader of the Republican Party in New York State, William Caldwell, wrote an editorial claiming that playing baseball was the best protection against cholera. That sounds nuts. Uh, it's not completely nuts. Uh, even the epidemic that we're living through today, uh, medical experts will tell you that uh, being in good physical condition, keeping your vitamin D levels up, getting sunshine and exercise will help your immune system fight it off. Um, the sports movement was in its own way a reform movement, analogous to the other great movements of the day, like public health, temperance, abolitionism, feminism, and baseball. And many people, including Frederick Gunn, founder of the Gunn School, were involved in more than one of these movements. The United States sports movement was a few decades older than the sports of baseball. In the 1830s and 40s, it was looking for the right sport to get Americans interested in exercise. Uh, it tried boxing and gymnastics. Um, neither of them really uh, captured the public imagination. And then it tried cricket. Cricket was a maturing that international sport played by teams in open air. It had already come to the US from Great Britain and many early baseball players also played cricket. It was easy to play. All you needed was open space, a bat, a ball, and a couple of sticks. Reporters for the national sports weeklies, many of whom were Anglophile or actually English, tried to sell cricket for years as a national sport to Americans and failed. The American dog wouldn't eat the English dog food. Why not? Well. Our two countries are now the best of friends. We fight along the British in wars, consume British entertainment, enjoy gossip about the royal family. Uh, most of us like Downton Abbey. We admire our former colonial masters and we certainly don't fear them, but the relationship between these two countries was very, very different in the mid 19th century. Just before the potato famine refugees showed up in the late 1840s in New York City, 95% of the city's population was native born. The, the country, political nativism was a powerful force in national politics. Nativism today, we associate with hostility to immigrants, especially non-WASPs, uh, Africans, Asians. Uh, people think that the nativism in the 19th century was uh, largely an anti-Catholic anti movement, which is somewhat true. But mid 19th century nativism was equally hostile to Great Britain and Europe in general. America saw itself as exception, exceptional and needing protection from interference and influence by the old world. It was common in pre-Civil War New York for nativist institutions like militia units and clubs to explicitly exclude the foreign born, even those who would come to, from England as children. Mid 19th century Americans feared British military power. Our two wars of independence were vivid in the living memory of many. Only 30 years before the founding of the Knickerbockers, a British army had burned the White House. Many New Yorkers at the time of baseball's birth had fathers and grandfathers who'd fought and died for their country's independence from England. It's ironic that few of us today remember the War of 1812, but we do stand up and sing about it before every professional baseball game. How powerful a force was nativism in, the, in America? Well, you may never have heard of this incident. It's called the Astor Theater Riot. And it arose in 1849 in Manhattan when the greatest American Shakespearean of the time, a man named Ned Forrest, and his English rival, uh, William McCready, happened to be playing the same part, Macbeth, about five blocks apart in Lower Manhattan. Um, <clears throat> nativist. <clears throat> provocateurs like Ned Buntline and Isaiah Rinders, who are New York City politicians, nativists and early members of the Know Nothing movement, um, they actually provoked the riot by breaking up uh, McCready's performance of Macbeth. Um, the, uh, to make a long story short, the New York City mayor made a huge mistake by calling out the state militia, including artillery, to stop uh, the um, demonstration. Um, the troops ended up getting cornered and firing on the crowd and they killed 30 
protesters and wounded 100 in a fight about whose Shakespearean actor was the greatest. Now, this is not simply a one-off incident. I don't know of any baseball clubs today who are named after war heroes. In the amateur era, many baseball clubs expressed their nativism by naming themselves after heroes of the revolution or the war of 1812 or patriotic symbols. Some of the most common names of baseball clubs are Columbia, National Independence, Eagle, Liberty, Young America, Union. And then there are the war heroes, Lafayette, Franklin, Hamilton, Wayne, Marion, Lawrence, all of those men fought against the British. Remembering the founding of the Knickerbockers, William L. Ladd, another founding member, put it this way, quote, the reason we chose the game of baseball instead of, and in fact, in opposition to cricket, was because we regarded it as a purely American game. And it appears that there was at that time considerable prejudice against adopting a game of foreign invention, unquote. Okay, so cricket was out. But why did the sports movement settle on the New York game and not the other native bat and ball games played in Boston, Philadelphia, or elsewhere? And the short answer is that it was New Yorkers who led the American sports movement. The movement drew on the economic and cultural power and prestige of New York City. And it didn't hurt that New York was the center of American publishing. In a way, it's completely unsurprising that they chose their own game. In 1858, 25 clubs met and formed a governing body called the National Association of Baseball Players. And yet every single club was from the New York City metropolitan area except Liberty of New Brunswick, New Jersey, which isn't very far away. The first president of the organization, William Hathaway Van Cott, who we mentioned before. And one of the first things they did was invent an origin story, the Knickerbocker story to help market the game. Uh, the Massachusetts game and town ball, the Boston and Philadelphia bat and ball games, they have no origin story and never did because they made no effort to proselytize. The New York game, in short, is the only Native American game with an ambition to be a national sport. Okay, we were talking before about the er emerging urban bourgeoisie. They look like this. The myths and lies that baseball told were part of the marketing effort, which was aimed at this class. The Knickerbockers and Alexander Cartwright, they didn't form the first adult baseball clubs. And shocking even to me, when I, as I researched this episode, everyone at the time knew it. The Knickerbockers were agents, not product, were not agents, they were products of baseball's ambition. They themselves did almost nothing to spread baseball. Their contribution was merely to serve as a brand, an effective brand that was used to market baseball to the emerging urban bourgeoisie. All right, this is an 1850 map that shows the American population distribution and the railroads. It shows you how concentrated the US population was in the narrow corridor dominated by New York, Boston, and Philadelphia where baseball took root. And it also shows you why the Northeastern quadrant of the country produced the most baseball talent well into the 20th century. And why until 1957, every major league franchise could fit into this quadrant of the country. Now, this is a <clears throat> lovely map from my book, and it shows a little more detail about how baseball spread. Um, baseball spread directly. It was spread by the national sports media after they stopped promoting cricket and adopted baseball. It was spread by baseball club tours like the Excelsior tour that I mentioned and later ones. And it was spread through national conventions. It was also spread indirectly following new transportation technology. In a sense, baseball went everywhere entrepreneurial and enterprising New Yorkers went when they went there. So it doesn't spread outward from New York in some kind of uh, even way like uh, the ripples on a pond from a stone. Um, it actually goes where the action is. Uh, you'll notice that New Orleans has baseball uh, before ri um, Richmond, Virginia. And it has it in the, as early as Washington, D.C., um, which is uh, there's only one explanation for this. And that is that uh, New York City played a huge role in the cotton business. In fact, the Cotton Exchange was founded in New York, not in New Orleans, where the cotton was shipped. Um, there's even a lot of early baseball men involved in the cotton trade. Um, when 
New Yorkers flooded to California in 1848 and 9, they brought their bat and ball game with them. So they were ready to form baseball clubs when the movement arrived in the 1850s. So you see a club in Sacramento in 1859. Um, so baseball followed emerging transportation networks. Uh, and sometimes it goes where the networks are going, not where the population centers are. The first baseball clubs in Canada are between Buffalo and Detroit following a railroad line. They're not going straight to Toronto and Montreal. They're in places like Hamilton and Guelph and Woodstock. Um, so baseball is going uh, up the Hudson by steamboat, out the Erie Canal to the Midwest, by railroad to Canada and the Mid-Atlantic, by canal and railroad to Philadelphia, by boat to New England, to New Orleans, to Mobile, to Charleston with the cotton trade. Another important route that baseball followed outward from New York was had to do with education. Well-off New Yorkers sent their uh, children away to school. And this spread the game. There are many, many examples. Yale has informal baseball clubs in the 1850s. Harvard, uh, there's a famous Harvard club formed by the class of 1866 that was actually formed in 1863 uh, that uh, was became a sensation and promoted the game in the Boston area and is the indirect parent of the Cincinnati Red Stockings, a number of whose members, whose founders were going to law school at the time in Cambridge. The founder and leader of Washington, Connecticut, Washington, Connecticut's gun school, Frederick Gunn, who was a member of the class of 1837 at Yale, along with uh, a member of my family, wrote in the alumni news in 1867, I have 30 to 35 boys gathered from all over, but mostly from New York and Brooklyn. And that's probably a main reason why uh, uh, Gunn, who was interested in promoting sports, um, uh, his school became a hotbed for baseball because the kids arrived from New York and Brooklyn playing the New York game. We mentioned people who overlap these different reform movements. Um, Gunn was a passionate abolitionist and a close friend of Judge Van Cott that we mentioned before. They were, ben, they were both active in the temperance movement. Um, this is the picture that Stephen was referring to before, possibly the oldest action photograph of baseball in existence. And it's in 1869 on the Washington Green. Um, interesting thing to me about it, besides that's uh, Mr. Gunn right there, I believe in the left side, um, that bear strip in the middle suggests that somebody was playing cricket there as well. There's no particular baseball reason for that. Um, so one of the byproducts of the relationship between William Van Cott and the gun school is that Van Cott sent uh, at least two of his sons to the school. This is Leonard Van Cott, one of the judge's sons, who um, was apparently a popular student. He played baseball there and uh, he went off to fight in the Civil War. Um, his classmates at Gunn gave him a, presented him with a sword in 1862. And later that year, he dies on the, at the front of typhoid fever. And there's a very touching letter that Judge Van Cott, his father, writes to Frederick Gunn in which he comforts himself that his son had sacrificed his life for the noble cause of ending slavery. As he wrote, God useth instrumentalities. Um, the first Cubans in baseball came to Fordham when their parents were worried about social unrest in Cuba and they sent them to study in New York. Um, one of them, Esteban Bayan, ends up, he's remembered in Cuba today as the founder of the Cuban Pro Leagues. All right, I'm gonna talk about one more thing, which is a question that I am often asked. And the question is, uh, if Cooperstown, New York isn't the birthplace of baseball and it's not Hoboken, New Jersey, then what is it? And my answer is, it's the city of, what well, was once the city of Brooklyn. Brooklyn and New York were independent cities until uh, 1898. If we go back to the beginning of baseball, New York City is old and prosperous and large. Brooklyn is young, dynamic, and booming. 
and there's an inner city rivalry growing more intense in the early and middle 19th century before it spilled out into baseball. But baseball and this inner city rivalry turned out to be a combustible mixture. The baseball movement's first important success was crossing the East River and conquering Brooklyn. It created the first inner city rivalry and it actually created the first fans, more or less by accident. And it generated the first real public interest for the very first time, baseball clubs were now representing something other than their players. Rivalries and fandom promoted the sport, but they also raised the stakes and they brought ultimately money into the game. And when that happened, there was no way going, of going back to pure amateurism. This is the 1860 Brooklyn Excelsiors, um, the team that I mentioned that Dr. Jones took on the road. Um, this guy with the baseball is Jim Creighton. Uh, baseball's first national star. Um, I mentioned that uh, the rivalry created fans more or less by accident because the people that were pushing the baseball movement were doing so in order to get people to play. And it never really entered their mind that it could be an entertainment business. Um, but the Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn, New York rivalry pulls all this uh, captures the public imagination, pulls interest and energy into the game. This slide is from 1865, and it's an attempt to portray the baseball world. And what's interesting about it is uh, it portrays the baseball world. See these banners on the left side, uh, clubs from New York and a few from uh, elsewhere. On the right side, clubs from Brooklyn. Um, it, baseball is a house divided between New York and Brooklyn. And there in the middle is the first ballpark that was built in Brooklyn in 1862 as a entrepreneurial venture um, by a non-baseball man because uh, he, was, he uh, realized that fans would pay to watch baseball. Um, okay. Um, I'll say one more thing about this. Um, in 1858, the um, four years after the founding of their first club, the Brooklyn clubs felt like that they were good enough to beat the Manhattan clubs and they challenged them to a all-star series, best two games out of three. Um, what's interesting about it is that they were originally gonna have it in the Elysian Fields, which is sort of an open space. And at the last minute, they moved it to a horse racing track in Corona, Queens, because they began to realize a lot more people were gonna come to it than they thought. And they charged 10 cents admission not to make money, but to cover the groundskeeping fees after they messed up the um, turf at the horse racing park. Um, to everyone's complete shock, about 10,000 people showed up at the first game. And to put that in context, um, a year earlier, if uh, 200 people had attended a baseball game, it would have made big news in the newspaper. So this was the message that people outside of baseball, more than even than within the game, got that baseball could be a business and it led to the uh, building of this 1862 um, field. And um, if we're talking, while well, we're talking about the Brooklyn New York rivalry and how old it is, uh, let's not forget that it brought energy and public interest into baseball for more than a century. And in a couple of slightly altered forms is still with us. The Dodgers Giants rivalry on the West Coast is descended from it as it, are, as uh, was the Dodgers, the Dodgers um, Yankees in the um, 20th century, Dodgers and Giants, San Francisco Giants versus the LA Dodgers, even the Mets and Yankees are in a way descendants of this original baseball rivalry. Okay, in um, 1861, baseball took a pause and as most of its players joined the army went off to fight in the Civil War. Um, the Civil War, uh, the, the uh, historians, uh, there's a running debate about whether the Civil War helped or hurt baseball development or something in between. But, and if you wanna read more about it, I'll refer you to my book. But the interesting thing about this picture is uh, it tells you something about the state of baseball during the war. This is a uh, July 4th celebration in Salisbury, North Carolina at a Confederate POW camp. And you'll notice that it's full of people who appear to be portraits of real people because they are. Um, 
you can see on the right sitting in a chair with a really good seat to the right of the batter is uh, Colonel Michael Corcoran, um, the ranking officer in the camp. Um, and the other interesting thing about the game is you see how some of the players have ribbons pinned to their chest that look like little X's. What's going on here is that it's a game of only officers and one side is New York, New York State, and the other side is everybody else, which tells you something about the relative competitive levels in New York versus the rest of the country. And the artist makes a point, the artist who was a prisoner of actually um, professional artist uh, named Otto Bedecker, who was a prisoner in the camp who drew the drawing that this is based on. He makes a point of showing that the Confederate guards are completely uninterested in the game. There's a crap game going on behind home plate. They're not really watching. Um, so there was this um, uh, idea promoted by Albert Spaulding that baseball had spread the um, game to the South and it helped heal the wounds of the war. Uh, if you want to read more about that, I would refer you to my book, but I, I don't think that's really true. What it did do was it spread it to the Midwest um, simply by having 400,000 young men from New York mixed in with people from Indiana and Illinois and Wisconsin. Okay. This is uh, a, game, a game that was played in 1870. We're, we're at the end of the amateur era. And this is a book that gets a lot of attention in baseball histories because um, it's played between the Cincinnati Red Stockings. And this is the team that had the uh, long undefeated streak. Um, they're pretty well remembered. Um, Major League Baseball in 2019 wore um, uh, patches on the uniforms because MLB considers this team to be the first professional team. Um, they, uh, Cincinnati put together a baseball club and starting in late 1868, they won all of their games, uh, including the entire um, almost 60 game schedule of 1869. In 1870, their winning streak has reached 84, and they show up in Brooklyn to play the Brooklyn Atlantics, who were a great amateur era team that was a bit past its prime. Um, the Red Stockings are certainly favored to win this game. Um, the way this game is usually described in baseball histories is that it's a professional team, the Cincinnati team, against an amateur team, which is the Brooklyn Atlantics. And it's the truth is really not, not really that simple. Um, by the late 1860s, and uh, for the reason we only have to look at the Fashion Course series and the, uh, the that was the Inner City All Star series and the advent of um, paid admission to ballparks in 1862, um, money had come into the game, and the top amateur clubs like the Brooklyn Atlantics, they were giving their players a slice of the gate. And this um, was actually legalized in 1869 by the amateur baseball governing body. Um, the Red Stockings paid their players, put them under contract like modern players do, but it's not true that they were the first to pay their players or even the first to put their players under contracts. Um, they were the first to do something. <laughs> and that was that when they, this found, the city fathers of Cincinnati put together this team, they decided to hire the best players they could get from everywhere in the country. And that was something, that was an innovation. In the late 1860s, players were moving around a bit, but the, I, it was considered slightly outrageous to simply go around and try to buy an all-star team, which is what they did. Only one of the players was a native Cincinnatian. Virtually every member of the Brooklyn Atlantics was a long time, if not native, resident, if not native of Brooklyn, and had come up through their network of youth clubs. So they meet in June 14th, 1870. And this game is a huge turning point for professional baseball and really in the relationship between the top clubs and their communities. Um, it was an incredibly exciting extra inning game, which is one when the uh, Atlantics gave up two runs in the top of the 11th and score three in the bottom. Uh, the whole city goes crazy. And um, it's interesting to read what the Brooklyn Daily Eagle said at the time um, they say, they didn't say amateurism has defeated professionalism. They said, this baseball organization, which chooses to call itself Cincinnati, but which belongs to the four quarters of the country, 
It was the greatest game ever played. This Red Stockings Club was not formed as our ball clubs are by young men who love the game for itself. The Red Stockings are literally nothing but a pick nine of professional baseball players, the best that could be hired from all parts of the country. Um, so the distinction they're drawing is that these guys are mercenaries, not simply professionals. So the Red Stockings success from a historical point of view, um, it did lead to the founding of the first National Professional League in 1871, which five years later, the National League that we still have today was founded. But what, the prof what professional baseball didn't do was invent baseball either as a game or as a sport, because that had already been done by amateurs. The ideals of the amateur era had staying power and they linger today, even in the professional setting. For instance, you know, I don't think we often think about it, but somewhere deep in our hearts, we like to think that professional franchises that we root belong to us in a way. Um, it's why we get so excited when a local player makes the big league club. The truth is that our professional franchises that we root for belong to us only in the sense that we pay for them. Okay, um, I hope that gives a flavor of the book and we'll get you interested in reading more. Um, I'm ready to take some questions. And um, before I do that, let me just show you this. Thank you for listening to this. Um, this um, code here will take you to the website for my book. If you want to read some more excerpts. And um, I'm going to cut out of the slide so you can see me better in case anyone has any questions. So uh, Thomas, thank you so much. This is just absolutely fascinating uh, that you uh, put the history and story of baseball in the context of, of American, uh, early American history. So we have some questions here. Um, what, what do we know about African-American participation in baseball in the early days? There isn't a oh, lot that's been said. Yeah, um, I mean, the interesting thing about it to me is we do, here's what we do know. We know that African-Americans like native born white Americans were playing baseball at a very early time. And um, unfortunately, we don't know a lot about them directly in the formative years. And the main reason being that newspapers weren't covering really anything that African Americans were doing in Brooklyn, where, where there were known baseball clubs in the 1850s. Um, so how do we know they existed? Well, there's a few scattered mentions. And um, one of the main reasons we know is that in the 1860s, African American baseball springs out into the open with clubs that are actually very competitive. Frederick Douglass's son played second base on a club in, based in Washington. Um, there's a club in Philadelphia that was a uh, named the uh, Pythians, and they were good enough that they actually tried to join the National Baseball Association. Um, this created, this caused a huge controversy in 1867. But, um, you know, one interesting fact about uh, integration, which there was some pressure to for baseball to integrate in the amateur era, ultimately it failed and had to await the late 19th century. Um, but one interesting part of the story to me is that so many of these early baseball players like uh, Mr. Ben Cott are passionate abolitionists. <clears throat> he sent his son to the war. Many baseball players risked their lives and died in the war in their minds to free slaves and end slavery. And yet none of their baseball clubs were integrated. When the subject of integration actually comes up, it's about can white and, club base, can white and black clubs play each other, not can an individual club integrate. So an, we have another question here. You mentioned, we're talking about baseball uh, beginning as a reform movement of sorts, and uh, it overlapped with feminism and others. Did women play baseball at all or other sports at the time? And exactly how did baseball overlap feminism in the mid 19th century? Well, that's a really fascinating topic. And the answer is yes, they did play. And it was Women exercising at all was controversial in some quarters in America in the mid 19th century. But um, many of the feminists that founded the first women's colleges, most of them, in fact, believed in exercise and sports for women. Uh, people, Mary Lyon, who founded Mount Holyoke, um, 
the uh, Smith uh, Vassar College and Smith College had women's baseball teams earlier than many parts of the country had men, men's baseball teams. And some of these sports reform members like Dr. <clears throat> Jones, uh, Colonel Thomas Fitzgerald in Philadelphia, out and out uh, supported feminism. And as part of that, believed in exercise for women. So what do you think baseball's founding fathers, um, what would they think of baseball today? Well, that's a good question. Um, Albert Spalding would probably be very impressed with how much money it's making. Um, but I think a lot of the amateur founders, the first thing they would say is, you know, we have a tendency to look at baseball through the lens of professional baseball. And even people like friends of mine that I play softball with, um, they kind of think, you know, softball's just something we fool around with on the weekend, but the serious stuff is Major League Baseball. Some of the people that were members of the sports reform movement that, that really made baseball our first sport, what they would say is we succeeded because this country, which used to, uh, in, in which adults almost never exercised, is now everyone's playing something. And no one has to argue. You won't read in any paper in the 21st or the 20th century uh, an argument for why adults should stop working and take time out to exercise. We all believe that it's good for us to be in shape and we all play sports. And the number of people that play amateur sports, of course, dwarfs the number of people that play professional sports. So I think most of them would be absolutely delighted. Um, uh, quite a number of them, a number of them would be happy that major league sports are integrated. Uh, throughout your lecture, you've uh, shown us a number of illustrations of, of the fields, but um, how did the game or how did the field look in the 1850s and 1860s? How was the game played that might be different from today's modern game? Well, um, that's a good question. It did evolve from this, the period that we're talking about here is the mid 1850s, to 1870. But during that entire period, at the beginning of it, uh, there's no gloves, there's really no equipment. Um, the most amazing thing to me is to think of two things. One is the catcher, because fast pitching came in in the late 1850s into the 1860s, and it was fast pitching, they were throwing underhand. But imagine, you've probably all seen a fast pitch softball pitcher. I mean, the ball's coming at you pretty fast. Imagine the catcher with no equipment, and I mean no equipment, no shin guards, no gloves, no face mask. And there are pictures of people like Joe Leggett of the Excelsiors standing up behind a batter with two strikes with his hands trying to prevent a pitch from breaking his cheek or his nose and catch a foul tip. It's pretty amazing. And another exciting detail is um, there are games we have descriptions of where uh, the great outfielder is going back on a ball with the game on the line in the ninth inning, deep fly ball to left center field, and the center fielder runs over and catches it barehanded diving. Um, this must have been really, really thrilling. Well, I, I think that's what we have for tonight. And uh, this has just been tremendous, really. Thank you so much, Thomas. It's, it's just really just been so enlightening and informative uh, in so many different layers um, and layers of history, layers of, of knowledge about baseball and to combine the two is just um, very fascinating. So thank you for that. So uh, again, before I say good night and thank you to our audience, thank you. Um, please go online tomorrow um, on the museum's website and please think about supporting the Give Local um, Fund Drive um, for the museum. So um, many, many thanks to you in advance and thank you again, Thomas. This is just brilliant. And, and also I have a copy of your book and I have been starting to read it. So I do, I can, I can advocate for the, your book too. It's just great. It's so much fun. Okay, well, it was right. wonderful for me too. Thanks, and thanks to everyone who tuned in. All right. Thank Bye -bye. you. Good night. Bye-bye.